Good morning, everybody. Please have a seat. Welcome. Thanks so much. Please have a seat. Thanks so much. And you know, Kimberly knows a little bit about who we are too. She's class of '92. Uh, so this is an awesome event. I was saying we, this is the third time we've done it, and uh, other entities around uh, Colorado Springs have given state of uh, their installations uh, presentations more often than we have. But uh, I think we're really coming of age thanks to the, the great people you're going to meet today and the things you're going to see. So for those of you who have not been in this beautiful facility, the home of the Center for Character and Leadership Development, the Air Force Academy, um, working name is uh, Polaris Hall. Uh, please take advantage of the tour and have a chance to see this magnificent building. It's been called by the Denver Post an architectural marvel. And uh, indeed it is. And for those of us who actually climbed up the, the uh, scaffolding on that day uh, a couple years ago for the Oculus to go up, I think you'll uh, appreciate all the more the 966 panes of glass that go into this and the fact that at 39 degrees north latitude, the altitude of Polaris, the North Star, which is the brightest star in Ursa Minor, the navigation point for mariners and travelers and airmen uh, over the millennia, that's, that's our aim point too, that's a moral compass. And so 39 degrees up is a moral compass. In fact, if we can go, do we have the other picture with the time lapse on it? Show the constancy. This is not an art form, this is a time lapse photograph. And it conveys the constancy of our purpose, not just the constancy of the North Star, but the constancy of our purpose. And that this building is aimed at the North Star. It's not leaning, it's aimed at the North Star because that's our moral compass. And behind me is the heart of this building. And it's the, the court where the honor code is adjudicated. It's where the cadets sit with each other to hold each other accountable for, um, and actually this is when Secretary Carter, Secretary of Defense visited us, for enforcing on ourselves the honor code. We will not lie, steal, or cheat, nor tolerate among us anyone who does. That's the purpose of this building. That's the heart of it, and if you're seated, at the end of the table, as is Secretary Carter there, you look up the Oculus, which leads right into that Oculus to the North Star as a, as a not very subtle reminder of why we're here and what we're trying to do and what remains constant. But even though that remains constant, our core values, integrity, service, excellence, the world's changing. The world keeps turning. Uh, the profession of arms has become more modern. The way we deliver education, the way knowledge is expressed, the way we communicate, the profession of arms has become modern as well. So the modernity that you see here, resting on the foundation of the constancy and values is truly symbolic of what we're trying to do. And so as you have a chance to look around at the collaboration rooms and the way they're set up for Wi-Fi and the way we use technology here, this is the modern part of who we are, but it looks different. It's the first addition to the skyline of the Air Force Academy for a very long time. And that's exciting because we're in a new place as we go forward. You're going to see some other things that are new too, is that the training that we do is purposeful and focus on warrior ethos as much as it's ever been, if not more so, from the faculty to the athletic department to the commandant's domain, that the training is purposeful. But there are some things that look different. Freshmen eat in Mitchell Hall, which for the graduates, you know, that's unique. Uh, we actually work with them, if you, if you ever go through recognition with them, as we just did, and see the, the meaning and the relevance of the training they go through. Uh, yes, they do a lot of push-ups and sit-ups and running and shouting, but they also really think about the seriousness of our profession. And our curriculum, the interdisciplinary curriculum that our wonderful faculty has brought about, and the way we problem solve, and the way we do research, number one uh, undergraduate research institution according to the National Science Foundation, that's changed. But one thing needed to be brought up to speed. Forever at the Air Force Academy, part of the curriculum for physical education for men was boxing. But now it's part of everyone's curriculum, men and women box. It's part of warrior ethos, it's part of courage, of knowing what to do when somebody shocks you. You can't freeze, you have to have your wherewithal. And they're getting the same results and confidence and courage that the men have for a long time, but now all the cadets have that opportunity, and we don't know what world we're preparing them to go fight in. Where's the front line in the modern profession of arms? Is it in cyber? Is it in space? Is it on a train in France? Where's the front line? How do we prepare them? That's why the training we're trying to provide is purposeful, 
and as challenging as ever. And, uh, and we want to tell you more about that. The great thing about the modern profession of arms is an airplane, a satellite, the ballistics of a missile don't care what you look like. They don't care where you came from. They care that you can do your job, that you can back up your fellow airmen, that you can be a great wingman to them to do their job. And that's why we're trying to tailor what we do here to prepare these graduates to be leaders in that modern profession of arms. We know not what that brings, and we hope that we're, we're doing them right so that they're ready for that moment that we can't even predict. And so everything we do here is really about warrior ethos, and that's why the National Character and Leadership Symposium's topic was about that this year, and I'll talk more about that. Another look at the modern profession of arms. What I'm going to show you next has to do with part of the modern profession of arms, remotely piloted aircraft. So we have a video that we're going to show you that is, uh, features a first lieutenant graduate of the academy. So that means this young officer has been graduated from here less than four years. And we send them out into the world to fight, uh, again, wherever the front lines may take them. And, uh, and he is going, in a matter of two minutes, this will be a two-minute video, He's going to identify the location of a vehicle-borne improvised explosive device downrange. He's going to coordinate in this joint, interconnected, global world we have with entities from every other service and coalition partners and be able to take out the threat without harming 850 friendlies who are within a mile of this explosion that you're going to see. So if we could run the video, please. South towards the grid you gave us. Voodoo 46. Can you confirm armor on the vehicle? 46. Voodoo 46, stand by. Confirm. Hey, what's going on? Hey, uh, here's a 9 line for you. For uh, the Vic that you're looking at, the Mad Max looking vehicle. Got it, send it. Alright, this will be Type 2 bomb on target, lines 1, 2, 3 from the overhead. 9588 feet, label this Mad Max. Stand by for uh, friendlies, but it'll be no mark. Stand by for friendlies, oh, egress overhead. ROE will be 008, correction, 001. And we're looking for our best final attack heading for this. Please, sir. Copy, I got 588R sensors dynamic. It's currently stopped. We can go right now while they're stopping and get these guys. Perfect. And you're cleared out of your call with heading. Laser on. Heading hold coming off. Laser. Ready when you are. Ready. Ready. That's a vehicle, just shoot it. 4 6 is in from the east. Cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. Ready? Shoot it. Cleared hot on Ludo. And. Rifle, 25 seconds. Rifle. Say again, first time. Rifle. 20 seconds. Rifle, 20 seconds. There we go, Voodoo. We got your shot off, man, on some legit packs. Copy, Tom. Voodoo, say status. Come on, baby, hit him. Voodoo, 4-6, rifle, 5 seconds, splash. And they'll stay overhead to get the battle damage. And they've got to have the moral courage to do the right thing, to coordinate with each and every one of those entities. And they don't know what their rank is. They don't know what service they're in. They just know that they bring it. So hopefully, everything we do can help prepare them for that moment when they can get that right and people can count on it. And what's uh, wonderful here is that there are so many dimensions to this now in the modern profession of arms. So if you go to the next slide, please. We have a satellite program here that we work with the Air Force Space Command. And uh, Falcon Set 6 should be launching uh, soon on a SpaceX, which is also a sign of the modern profession of arms, with Space Command, working with commercial entities to get the lift to put our satellite in orbit. Falcon Set 7 is a solar telescope about the size of a loaf of bread, about the size of this sheet of paper, that will be hitching a ride on a, a rocket soon, and we'll be planning Falcon Set 8 to launch in FY19. So our cadets really 
fly the satellites, and they do it as a team. This is this decision-making, problem-solving, interdisciplinary work that we do, that it's not all physics majors, it's not all astronautics majors, it's people who can manage the program and understand how to communicate it and connect it. There's more to technology than just the technology. There's a sociology and a, physiology, a physic psychology with that that I think we'll talk about more later because I think we're starting to realize that it's not just about the technology. Although the technology is cool, and a physics department has also just run a sci uh, an experiment up to the International Space Station that's just been delivered up to look at the impact of spacecraft thrusters on the experiments that go on inside the, the space station. So this level of attention to detail, the depth of knowledge, the collaboration, the way they solve problems, it's real. And the dean promises me and the team that they're not making it any easier. And yet the cadet wing's GP, average GPA, for at least the uh, senior class, was over 3.0 average at the Air Force Academy. They're taking it seriously and they're doing great. And we're really proud of them. Let me tell you about some more people here in the modern profession of arms. So this is Lieutenant Colonel Christine Mao in her F-35. And our graduates are starting to go into F-35s out of pilot training, and well, actually F-22s out of pilot training. So last year's Cadet Wing Commander in the spring, uh, now Lieutenant Sophia Vasiliadis, got an F-22 out of pilot training. And our other graduates are as well. So uh, we're sending our airmen out to do the work of the Air Force in all these different ways, and we're really proud of them. And our airmanship programs here and everything we do, we think prepares them very well for that. Also, the, uh, they're more physically fit than ever. You know, we hear all these stories about this generation, right, and how fit are they. But for those of us who graduated from here, we know since 1965 we've had something called the physical fitness test, the PFT, with five events. So push-ups and pull-ups and sit-ups and broad jump and a 600-yard run, and that's the same that hasn't changed. What has changed is that they're better at it than we were. <laughs> And we actually started measuring that in 2002 so that to be on the superintendent's list, you, don't, you can't just be on the dean's list and the commandant's list, but they need to be on the athletic director's list, the fitness test. And the scores on the fitness test have continued to go up uh, to the point where the level of fitness is, is really extraordinary. And we have far fewer uh, on, on athletic probation, but if they can't do it, they're on athletic probation too because this is a, a whole program and, and they're incredibly fit at this. And, uh, and carry it over to, if we could go back one more, please. If we carry it over into intramurals. So there's fitness and with the famous flutter kicks, which we all love very much, and uh, intramurals. So they do it in, in the intramurals as well because competition is part of the warrior ethos, not just for a score on the fitness test, but it's about fighting to win. And we do that in intramurals and in almost 100 clubs. And some of the clubs are on the dean's team. And before we went over to the next slide, I wanted to stop and acknowledge our, our moot court team from legal studies majors primarily. Our moot court team finished the season number two in the country. I think that's pretty awesome. So our, our cadets fly, fight, and win in airspace and cyberspace and in the courtroom. So we think that's awesome. So we can go to the next one. So we all know about Wings of Blue, how fantastic they are. So they went to the national, um, the US uh, parachuting uh, championships this year and got 38 medals, 38 medals, and uh, Cadet First Class Adam Fly, which is the greatest name ever, um, Adam Fly uh, was named the top collegiate competitor in the country, and, uh, and also some sportsmanship broke out there because uh, Adam got a, a prize of $500, which we, as federal people we can't really accept. Um, he gave it to the University of Yukon team. They're struggling. They don't struggle in women's basketball very much, but they were struggling in, in the parachuting, and they cut away a chute and lost it. In fact, our team from the 98th uh, Flying Training Squadron repacked their chutes so that the, the Yukon team could, could participate, could compete themselves. That's the kind of cadets that we have, I think exemplify integrity first, service before self, excellence in all we do and to turn around and, and pass it forward that way to, to that team. We're really proud of them. Let me tell you about some more. So we've also got uh, Cadet First Class Sailor Gilbert. And this stuff really blows me away. Well, the, well, everybody else maybe takes a weekend off. She would collect the used crutches at the Cadet Clinic, and we amass a few of those. And made them available to people in other countries. She was commended not just by our Air Force, 
in our research awards that we had the other day. But she was commended by the chief of staff of the Nigerian Air Force because the medical supplies she helps provide to them help them set up another clinic. And it wasn't just the crutches. She had a chance. I don't know if you can see. That's a Google. She was an intern at Google. Now, this is not the terrazzo. Don't worry. Um, but she was at Google. We have hundreds of cadets participate in summer research programs and internships across the country and across the world. And while she was at Google, she was able to work on some of these, these uh, methodologies to help support Nigerian um, displaced persons, uh, which we, we don't think about refugees a lot in our country. We're really fortunate, but people around the world face that. So Taylor um, has done, it really excelled not just as a cadet here, but in her service to mankind, and we're really proud of her. But wait, there's more. So let me tell you about Tristan Briggs. Tristan is a private pilot. He's on the triathlon team. He's on the cadet flying team. He's uh, something called a peer here, which is a, uh, for those of you from civilian schools, it's like a, a resident assistant, but someone who's a real, really present for the other cadets to make sure that if they have needs that they can communicate those and get the help they need. So he's got a, a, a servant's heart. And uh, he also realized if he had some flying time, he could help save uh, dogs that kill clinics uh, across the Midwest in the mess. And he saved, he saved uh, 19 uh, animals that he's brought back to Colorado Springs and Denver. Um, but he doesn't just reach out to the animals. He's, he's, uh, he's a giving person. So he's worked downtown with young people who are in detention centers and maybe don't seem to have much of a future and talks to them about his love for flying and the potential for them and their careers. You know, I just, I don't recall cadets participating in those kinds of activities when I was a cadet. I think this generation is one to be proud of and we just want to help launch them and prepare them the best we can. And we do it in all facets. So our athletes here are cadet athletes, they're student athletes, and I want to commend Mr. Knowlton and the athletic department uh, for really enforcing that so that the coaches are teaching character development, not just their sport. And so the athletes have, just amongst the intercollegiate athletic teams, 27 of them, contributed uh, 2,560 community hours over the, over the last year, and that's 11 to 12 per cadet, who, who are pretty busy each and every day. But they, they take time to give to others, and our baseball team is pretty extraordinary. They tend to do it on the road. They'll do it on road trips and go do community service out on the road, which helps people understand who we are. You saw a video at the beginning of the presentation that Kimberly ran. We like to think that's our brand. Hopefully, for those of you who went here or those of you who know us, that resonated. And you said, yeah, that's, that's what we think of. That's, that's who the Air Force Academy is. These kids are who we are, too, and we're really proud of them. And the, the, their character and their performance in the classroom has not hurt their performance on the fields of friendly strife. And so I, I think most of us are familiar with the fact there was a, a superintendent at a little school in New York they had named uh, MacArthur, who said, on the fields of friendly strife are sown the seeds that on other fields, on other days, will bear the fruits of victory. So sports matter here, and they matter for those reasons. And it's also great for bragging rights, too. So for the 20th time, we won the Commander Chiefs Trophy in football. We beat Navy in, uh, what, 24 to, four, 28 to 14 in October and beat Army 31 to 12 in November. And we'll take the Commander Chiefs Trophy up to the White House later this spring. And for those hockey fans, you're tracking that our hockey team is ranked 15th in the country. They're going to go this weekend and play Western Michigan, which is ranked 8th, in Providence, Rhode Island, in, in the NCAA tournament. And uh, wouldn't it be great if they got to the Frozen Four? But one of the greatest things about the hockey team is they're really good cadets. So we have 27 intercollegiate uh, teams. Nine of them have team GPAs over 3.0. Twelve of them have military performance averages above 3.0. These are cadet athletes. These are student athletes. And we're really proud of what they do and what they accomplish. The, uh, let me tell you about someone else on the on the pool of friendly strife. So we have Genevieve Miller. Genevieve just uh, competed in the NCAA finals and came in 13th in a really easy uh, event that goes 1,650 meters. So that is a mile. 13th in the country, and she's a great cadet. And she was 16th in the 500 meters. And in those two events, she's been the champion of the Mountain West Conference 
every one of the four years she's been here and holds the Academy records and the Mountain West records and the Mountain West Championship records. And she's the first Division I swimmer, All-American at the Air Force Academy. If you've ever watched her, she's like an outboard motor. And she just goes and was really proud of that excellence on the pools of friendly strife. So let me tell you about somebody else. So this is Cadet First Class Tim Wang. And that's pretty easy to do that. I think we can all <laughs> we can do that. So he just uh, came in 25th in the nation, just barely missed, barely missed, and you guys will correct me to 100%, making the Olympic team. And he's a great cadet. That's where we're proud of. Let me tell you about Karina Gillespie. Our runners have just been owning, have just been owning the competition. So uh, Karina led the cross country team to a, a 10th place finish um, on the pre-nationals race. And for the first time, our women's cross country team was ranked in the nation in the top 20, I think. And uh, excellence in all we do. It's extraordinary. And the, I mean, if, I'm sorry if I could flip back though. The guys, the men's track and cross country teams have done the trifecta. They've won the last, uh, this last year, indoor championship in Mountain West, outdoor championship in Mountain West, and the cross country championship. So they're working hard, they're running hard, and they're running fast, and we're really, proud of what they do. And in fact, we've had uh, two Olympians last summer. Uh, one, Cale Simmons is a pole vaulter, a class of 2013. And Dave Higgins is class of 2016, and uh, came in 40th in the country, in the world, at the Olympics. And so uh, he's going to continue competing for many years. But our rifle teams are fantastic. And so here behind me, we'll show you Ryan Jacobs, who got the silver medal in the National Rifle Championships. And what I like a lot, being an airman is when we beat the ground forces at things like rifle. So, in fact, our rifle team beat Navy and Army, if you're keeping track, uh, beat Navy and Army this year in head-to-head -head competitions as well. So there's, there's maybe one big Commander-in-Chief's trophy, but we celebrate every time our, uh, our team wins against true peers, other people who are serving their country, brothers and sisters that we're going to serve with. But, but we love when we win on those friendly fields of strife. And now I'm going to take the other angle on this of the modern profession of arms. And you have to have that warrior ethos and have those skill sets. But one of my favorite things that's happened this year, is just recently uh, wrapped up in the last week, is the 58th uh, Academy Assembly, which is run by the political science department, which I used to be a part, and I'm a proud alumnus of the political science department. But the topic of the Academy Assembly was cyber warfare. As I said before, it's not just about the technology, it's about the psychology, the sociology, look what's happened over the last year as we think about casting data or information in doubt of, of the source and how that works. How do you sort through that diplomatically? So Admiral Mike Rogers was out here, the commander of U.S. Cyber Command, to talk to our Academy Assembly just last week and to think through what it is our young people are going to have to face as they go out into this, this modern world, this modern profession of arms. So we have a wonderful trajectory going. We're, we're flying high, we're climbing, we're wings level, we're doing great. But we're not perfect, and we have challenges. We have challenges too. One of our challenges is that we haven't communicated well enough as an institution, and I think today is a part of a new beginning and, and the kinds of things that will blossom over time. We need to communicate with these folks out in Facebook land or out in, uh, in, the, in the ether who are gonna hear this and see this, who maybe aren't here, and for you, by the way, we want you to take these stories and share them and tell them and, and we'll provide video for you to back you up so that you can have evidence of it. So if one person's opinion or one uh, headline comes out that's confusing, you'll have the background to be able to say, there's more to the story. There's more going on than just that one thing. And we haven't owned that narrative. We've allowed others to own that narrative on some things. And so we're gonna be better, we'll be better and uh, and I think you'll be able to see that today as we start uh, a new website. But before I go to that, I want to talk about a couple of other challenges. So guess what? We have humans here. Uh, cadets are humans, and they're between 18 and 22 years old. And faculty and staff are humans. And so uh, as part of the human condition, we, we are not immune from social challenges, like sexual assault prevention. And it's awful to talk about. We don't want to talk about it. But we can't fix some of these things unless we have these difficult conversations and say, what are we talking about? 
You know, we measure everything here. If somebody has unwanted t contact from somebody, unwanted sexual contact, or if they're raped violently, we report all of that. So people see our numbers, and they don't like talking about it. But when I go talk to other college leaders, they go, you know, we're facing the same thing. How do we get at it? In fact, many people see us as leaders because we are owning this and having the uncomfortable conversations and talking about giving people tools to avoid those kinds of situations, to understand that the pressures on social media and what happens, what part of social media captures that dark part of human nature that lends themselves to intolerable behavior but can't be part of who we are. Because we are about integrity first, service before self, excellence in all we do, and leaders of character respect each other. They respect wherever they're from, whatever they look like, whatever they sound like. That's tough. And that's a tough talk. And so when I've talked about that, it makes the people in the audience really uncomfortable, and me too. But guess what? They come. So next month, um, April 9th to 11th, the, the board of directors and some other guests are coming from the National Association of College Directors of Athletics to this building to have my team talk to them about what we do about healthy relationships and how we try to help the cadets do better, how we have to try to make our culture as good as we aspire for it to be, in spite of the fact that we're human and we, we have to keep working at this. This is difficult. So other people are starting to come to us to take on these really tough challenges and we, that we can't shy away from. And so we want to own it. Um, and, uh, I guess on a more mundane, and maybe more, you can breathe now, a more mundane, mundane topic, there are some things going on in the world that we aren't immune from either, right? So if there's a civilian hiring freeze across the federal government, and you're trying to run an institution of higher education that, where we give an accredited bachelor of science degree and a commission to every cadet, uh, that's tough. That's tough. To, uh, we, we follow suit with the Air Force to say we honor our civilian colleagues and we value them, and we, we still want to be innovative uh, to do more with less, but you can only do so much before the mission can be affected. So we're working really hard with the Air Force and with the Department of Defense to work on that. But that's a real challenge in our country as we align the way we apply resources uh, and, uh, and communicate with people. So that said, it's tough, and we've got to communicate better and better. And so with the help of some great experts on our team, we're going to have a new website that we're launching today. And uh, it'll be easier to use. It'll be uh, more accessible. It'll we'll have a link more effectively. And I think you'll find us in more in the modern world and the way we communicate to be able to tell our stories. You know, and, if, and when there's something that's not right and we're trying to fix it, we'll tell you about that too. But when something's great, we want you to know about that and share that everywhere you go. So we... I will say, uh, one of the other challenges that we face is, uh, is energy and perceptions and how we do things. So on energy, we've managed to figure out how to save a million dollars a year in utilities, which doesn't really show up in, a, uh, in the front page of things. But we are trying to use the innovation, not just in communication, but innovation in the way we do things. Now, um, the residents of Sajin Hall may think we're saving the money because we're not providing hot water. But that's not true. You know, I, I arrived here in 1977 uh, as, a, as a brand new cadet. And in 1977, um, Sajin Hall, circa 1975, was the new dorm. But that was in 1977. And, uh, and now we've already had a chance to renovate Vandenberg Hall. And we're going to be, in a, about two or three years, renovating Sajin Hall as well. And that'll be a, a very huge project over seven phases and over several years to make that uh, come to pass. What you're going to see sooner on the top image is the, one of the, that's the North Gate, but uh, our gates are going to have covers on them like the rest of the Air Force to get our defenders out of the ele elements out there. And that's going to affect traffic a little bit. So that's, that's coming on board. So that's going to look different. I've talked to more about, before about things looking different. We've talked about size and we've talked about the gates. Um, we're going to be working on Clune Arena to bring it uh, back up to speed. But also, we're going to have a uh, new visitor center. I know it's really important to the community for us to have this. And the timeline has been challenging as we learn our way to work with the community and work with private entities and public entities to bring that to pass. And we should be able to send a, a request for quotas in, uh, in the April timeframe. So 
Uh, we've had some delays on that, but I think we've had a chance to, to make a better stab at that, to live up to our obligations for the City for Champions and also the Region, Regional Tourism Act uh, that Colorado passed. So we take that very seriously, and that's, that's going to be coming on board as well. And uh, the chapel. So you may have noticed we have a very beautiful chapel over here, and we love it a lot. But it's over 53 years old. And uh, those of us over 53 years old know that we need some maintenance. So in, uh, in 2018, we're going to start putting scaffolding up on the, on the chapel, and we'll probably be down through 2022. And uh, one of the great challenges is to be able to move the artifacts out of it so they can be protected while we fix the leaks. It's, it's leaked forever, uh, glass and aluminum uh, with the materials of 1963. Uh, didn't seal up the best even then, but now with new materials and brilliant engineers, I think we'll be able to make it last, you know, another 50 or 60 years. But in the meantime, it'll be out of operation, which is tough because we count on it. It's a gathering place. It's a symbolic place. And so what we're doing, we're trying to find some synchronicity here with our planetarium, which you've seen as you came in, which actually has been under wraps for over a decade. We're going to bring it back to life as a STEM outreach center to work with uh, like Challenger school programs and star-based programs and have outreach to people. But also, if we can get a video experience of the chapel, that might be a great venue to share with visitors what our chapel is like, e even while we're repairing our chapel. So it comes together, and you're going to see a lot more movement. And I think you already see some different construction and, and movement forward uh, as we bring our institution to this generation, this millennium, this 20th, 21st century, and to be able to continue uh, to bring those that support uh, to not just the Air Force, but frankly to the community. So we actually have an economic impact on the community of about uh, 900 million to $1 billion a year and about 12,000 jobs. So we know we matter to the community. And we want the community to come out. So we've tried to be more creative about having people visit us, not just for the sporting events or for the uh, academic conferences, but also for things that just get you on, on base to say, this is your Air Force Academy. And, we need to be secure, but we want to be open as well. And so thanks to the Air Base Wing and the Defenders to be creative about how they do that, to be able to bring 50,000 people out here last year for a tiny houses jamboree, which, as I've said to others, is a tough thing to say in the halls of the Pentagon. But it's been a great outreach, and, and the HGTV has given great coverage to let the, uh, the country know we have an Air Force Academy. And we're going to do it again in the first week of August, another tiny house jamboree. And, you know, we had Tim McGraw out here last year and Brad Paisley and Blake Shelton will be back in September as well. And those are events as much for the community as for us because we're, we're proud to live in Colorado Springs. We're grateful to be here and we're grateful for the support that we have. And we want you to feel like this is your academy as well. So uh, exciting times indeed for us. Sometimes the changes are kind of bittersweet, though. So we've got some sweet parts here. So one each... Uh, Colonel Troy Dunn, our commander of our Air Base Wing, is now Brigadier General Select. Why don't you stand up, Troy? Brigadier General Select, Troy Dunn. We've had to say goodbye to uh, Brigadier General Steve Williams. He and, and his family have already gone off to Hawaii, where he's going to be um, in charge of operations and cyber uh, in the Pacific Air Forces. And you can imagine that's a busy place. And the person he was following needed to get into theater in Iraq, so he needed to leave sooner than we would have liked, but we've had almost three years of his great leadership. And Steve's had a chance to really help us move forward um, and, and try to help not just the cadets understand moving forward, but help those who've been here before understand that um, it does look different now. It, it does seem different, um, but it's not easier. It's, it's, a, it's a tough course of, of study and it's a tough regimen for our grads here. And he was part of that, but he did it with a heart. And he loved the cadets, and I think they admired him very much as well, so we'll miss him a lot. Um, the good news, as is always the case in the Air Force, is there's always some fabulous airmen in the wings who could come in and take us to the next, next level. So if we can go to that. So this is Brigadier General Select Kristen Goodwin, class of 1993, who was on the Wings of Blue as a cadet. She was an engineering mechanics major and played a little bit of soccer. And now she's a military assistant to the Secretary of the Air Force. She's a bomber pilot. Um, so she has time in C-130s, EC-130s, and B-2s. And she was the wing commander at Barksdale Air Force Base before she went to serve with the secretary. 
And so Kristen, we, we think we'll be here in the May time frame, and obviously in, in all the cases for our promotions, it's, um, we have to wait through all the, the confirmation processes to, to make sure they go. But we're anxious to see her on board. She's a great leader. She's going to be a great addition to our team. And uh, we're really excited about the future uh, with Kristen. So there you have it. And uh, every day, the cadets inspire me. The co my colleagues here that you see uh, from across the academy inspire me um, to try to be more creative, to, to try to be more innovative, uh, to take a chance to be better, uh, to help our Air Force in these, these challenging, challenging times. And I think you can see from just some of the examples I've shown you what great talent we have out there and dedication and skill. And uh, as with every endeavor we have in service, we just hope we, we give people the chance to be better than we are and help take it to the next level. And uh, so we're really proud of the Academy and uh, we're on the move. We're on a trajectory of, of flight into this new, this new millennium that I think is going to take us to great places and it'll blossom more and more over the coming years. So I hope you get a sense of that as well.